Okay, good afternoon everybody and thank you for joining us today to talk about the supply chain benefits of additive manufacturing um, with um, guests from Castor and a special guest from Xerox. So if you have not used this particular platform before, i.e. Remo, um, then I'll give you a few basic um, uh, basic pointers here. So you'll notice on the right hand side of your screen, um, there is a chat function. Um, this can be used to introduce yourself to uh, fellow attendees um, as demonstrated there by my colleague, Mile. And um, also on the right, you will find a Q&A section um, where if you click on there, you'll be able to ask our panelists questions throughout the event. Now, this is an interactive event, so we will be taking questions uh, from the audience at various points through the first part of the show. Now, the first part will be um, questions to the two panelists, and this will be followed by a round table discussion um, where there will be breakout rooms um, and you'll ha have the opportunity to ask more direct or specific questions uh, to representatives of Castor and also from Xerox as well. So what will we be talking about today? Well, we will present the status of the supply chain in the manufacturing industry and discuss the challenges and unmet needs for 3D printing can solve. We will talk about the hidden manufacturing costs that you might not have thought about, and also about potential savings using 3D printing that might surprise you. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests. So we have Omar Blair, who is the CEO and co-founder of Castor, and William McCall, who is Director of Operations at Xerox. Hi, Michael. Hi, everyone. Hi, Omar. Hi, William. Good morning. Good to see you both. Um, so before we get into the, the conversation today, maybe Omar, could you just quickly introduce yourself and maybe tell people a little bit about Castor, please? Sure. So thanks. Thanks again, everybody, for joining. I'm Omer. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Castor. Um, my background is mechanical engineering, but I also hold an MBA in entrepreneurship and innovations. They both from Tel Aviv University, which is where we sit. We're all from Israel. Um, I used to work uh, in the 3D printing industry in uh, strategies for many years, and this is how we got into this uh, destructive uh, um, startup that we're running, which we will explain afterwards uh, what it does. And um, I invite uh, all of you to ask questions. Thanks again. Excellent. Look forward to hearing more about uh, uh, this. And William, what do you tell us about yourself and what you do at Xerox, please? Yeah, absolutely. So William McCall, Director of Operations for Additive Manufacturing at Xerox Corporation. My overall background is in supply chain and manufacturing, both shop floor and you know, overall system design. Uh, at Xerox, my responsibilities are more on procurement and project management. And the overall effort that we have going on at Xerox for 3D printing is first focused on bringing our new liquid metal 3D printer to the market, launched earlier this year. And we have a couple of other uh, very cool things that we'll be making announcements for quite soon. Excellent. I'm sure people will be very interested about uh about what's coming up there. So, all right, without further ado, um, let's tackle our first question. So how do you see the status of the supply chain today? And what would you say are the biggest challenges that manufacturers are facing? Perhaps William, maybe you would take us yeah. through your perspective on this first, please. Absolutely. Uh, so jumping into it, at the highest level, the biggest challenges are all bottlenecks. And these are bottlenecks on a global scale. The things that make the news, uh, things that make the headlines, that's going to be like the the evergreen blocking the Suez Canal, costing hundreds of million do dollars per hour. Uh, the Texas freeze uh, about a year ago that just wrecked our uh, access to petroleum products, uh, including you know, resins and plastics that even impacted some 3D printing areas. And the one that makes the news almost every day, it seems, is the computer chip shortage. That's what makes the news. And there are other smaller ones that happen every single day. There are secondary and tertiary effects that just spiral out from there uh, and affect effectively all industries. So these are the things that companies are really struggling to adapt. You see it in the form of 
lead times being constantly pushed out in the form of prices constantly increasing, uh, you know, people just trying to you know, mitigate their uh, spikes in demand. And you also see it with uh, changes in the workforce. Uh, but all of these can be traced back to this root cause, uh, at least recently, of bottlenecks causing supply chain disruption. Thank you for that, William. And um, maybe if you give us uh, the Castle perspective, please. Yes, maybe to add uh, uh, to William's uh, uh, comments, I, I can add a few more aspects. I would say the first one is not only that it's more important to maintain an onshore manufacturing capabilities rather than offshore, it's also the uh, possibility of a company to change quickly from a supplier in France to a supplier in Spain or uh, the uh, spare parts manager in Brazil cannot send his spare parts to South Africa because of the there is no he can't go to work it's not allowed to go to work so we must the, the parts must ship somehow and it's all increasing the need for flexibility uh, we also see a lot of requests from companies and questions about sustainability, which means that companies are large organizations are now being measured more about how they keep the environment. And uh, uh, for example, companies cannot maintain larger warehouses than they have today. So they must start to think digital files and digital files is a challenging thing in additive manufacturing. A lot of the companies we meet still have 2D PDF uh, drawings or a uh, yellow paper that uh, represents the parts that they need to produce and they are mm, less ready for a fast movement when it comes to uh, uh, digital manufacturing. So um, yeah, those are the aspects we see today from a supply chain um, aspects. So um, just a reminder, um, you can use the Q&A to ask questions. We will be taking um, questions throughout this uh, session. Um, but you mentioned a couple of issues there, so such as bottlenecks, um, such as warehousing. Um, how do you see additive manufacturing as a driver to solve those kind of issues in the supply chain? And also, what are the benefits of 3D printing that can improve companies' ability to tackle their pain points? William, please. Absolutely. So in terms of how do you tactically deploy 3D printing to uh, solve some of your strategic business problems, there's actually some really good work coming out of uh, the, the field of academics, uh, sorry, the field of operations research that's just now hitting uh, the mainstream. And one of the areas that is most promising, like Or mentioned, is spare parts. It, it comes up again and again because when you have supply chain disruptions, when you have uh, bottlenecks, often these spare parts are some of the first ones that get squeezed out. Uh, almost by definition in almost all industries spare parts make a relatively small amount of revenue for your vendors if you're the oem you're not paying your vendors a ton of money for these parts but they're very important to your regular operations and when you are pressuring your vendors to deliver on time naturally they're going to focus on the higher volume ones so that's where 3d printing can come in because it can target areas that are very painful for you and your customers but maybe your vendors aren't feeling that same pressure, or maybe they're simply just not able to perform in the way that you want it to do. So this is where uh, we definitely see an opportunity for it. But you also need to justify it. You need to put it in terms of dollars and cents. So because 3D printing is almost always able to operate on a lot size of one uh, with minimal ordering costs, minimal setup costs, uh, that means that you can dramatically change actually how you service that inventory. So that uh, dropping down to an on-demand manufacturing solution will uh, absolutely reduce your cost of ordering, your cost of warehousing, uh, just the maintenance on the part numbers themselves. And two really big ones, one, your cost of capital. The amount of cash that you've got tied up in that inventory can go to zero because you're producing it on demand and scrap. Scrap is one of the biggest ones because in order to maintain that supply chain for these small, a relatively small demand spare parts, your vendors may enforce on you minimum order quantities. If you're only using you know, 10 pieces per year, but your vendor requires you to buy 100 at a time, well, you just bought 10 years worth of inventory. And statistically, 
you're going to scrap about half of it. Uh, 3D printing can absolutely address those issues where even though the per piece cost of 3D printing is more than traditional manufacturing, in the right circumstances, we can predict exactly how much money it will save you by eliminating all of those cost areas that we just mentioned. Uh, we published a model on this uh, a little while ago in Supply Chain Management Review, if you want to get into the math. Uh, I, this is the area where I get uh, really geeked out on it, uh, but there's some really great ways that you can deploy it to address those specific problems. Certainly um, take a deeper dive into the article maybe in the, uh, the networking session afterwards, and I think I'm going to share a link with people as well for, uh, for that particular paper. But Omar, what, um, what are your thoughts about um, what William was saying then? Yeah, I think William covered uh, a lot of the parameters that needs to be taken into consideration when trying to calculate all of the costs involved uh, for 3D printing versus traditional manufacturing method. Maybe just to, to emphasize one of them, uh, we've talked about shelf life or shelf time or shelf costs. Uh, in traditional manufacturing methods, you need to maintain the tooling and the minimum quantities of the parts that you've Produce. So you now have, let's say, 100 parts plus the tooling needs to be kept on a shelf, right? So that's real estate and that's, uh, that's costs involved. And, and these are the kind of things as a software company that we take into consideration that we will show afterwards how we calculate that. It starts from calculating the minimum quantities that uh, William was mentioning that you must keep in traditional manufacturing and in additive manufacturing you just don't have to you just can manufacture on demand and that's uh i would say the biggest advantage is to overcome those supply chain uh, um, challenges okay so we have a question from uh, john uh, john hartner here and um he's, this is a question for you william so could, um, what are some of the uh, or research papers discussing am and what institutes are focusing on this area. Yeah, so naturally the one that I'm gonna plug would be Duke University. We collaborated with them to write the article uh, that we published just a little while ago. Uh, and I actually, I can provide a, a list of all the, the journals that we cited for it. Uh, that would really be the best way to get the rundown on the, the full list. But the main one you'd wanna to go to would be uh, the Journal of Operations Research. That would be the place I would start. Thank you for that, uh, that answer. Right, well, if you have no further questions for now, let's uh, jump into uh, the next question. So what would you recommend to a company who decided to take advantage of the benefits of additive and to utilize them for enhancing their supply chain? Do you have any practical um, tips about how they can start on this journey, William? Yeah, uh, the, the typical advice would be to crawl, walk, and then run. Uh, sometimes you'll see companies jump in, they'll lay out $10 million, put a whole AM uh, you know, center of excellence and be surprised when they're not able to actually utilize it. So starting with one part, building the use case around it, proving that it works, really learning how you need to account for the cost and the benefits for your organization uh, before you go all the way into the deep end is really valuable uh, because they're all different. Every business has their own different unique supply chains and you need to really figure out uh, what do you care about? Uh, not every business accounts for costs the same way. Uh, that's particularly for spare parts. The other one would be if you are at the start of a product development journey, you have an interesting opportunity. You can make a decision the very beginning to dual source everything from traditional and 3D printing. That means that you can have your plastic injection molding for your mass market version, but when you're just starting up, you could 3D print it. And if you PPAP every part you know, that's reasonable to PPAP with both methods, when it comes time to manage that long tail of the supply chain, you'll have already made the investments at a much lower cost than it would to start all again with 3D printing when you already have a bunch of legacy systems in place. So those are two. One, if you're at the if you're already at the tail end of a product's lifespan, crawl, walk, run. And if you're at the very beginning, try to keep up everything. Uh, I think you'll see some huge benefits by having that dual sourced. 
come out? Yeah, it's a big question. I, I, I'm not sure if we can uh, give tips, I would say, of uh, utilizing additive. But what we can say is what we've saw from analyzing uh, about 30, 40,000 parts over the last year in our software. And we've saw some, mm, I would say, uh, issues that might be overcome by, by beginners. I'll touch two technical issues and one is a more of a financial aspect. Uh, um, the first technical issue is, is materials, okay? Uh, if we're talking about spare parts, you must compare uh, an additive manufacturing material to a traditional manufacturing material. And uh, I would say that it's true that engineers might need to compromise on additive manufacturing materials, but the only way to do that is to see the benefit in front of their eyes, meaning that if you calculate everything all the way to the end and you really see the savings in time, in flexibility, in cost reduction, then you can, you have the tools to maybe compromise over some mechanical property that you uh, gain, that you lose in additive, but you maybe gain something in design. So the first thing in, in materials is to, to see the whole picture. Uh, the second is about geometry few of the parts fails for geometry limitations just because additive have uh, has a, a lot of geometry limitations and and we all know that the the holy grail is DFAM designed for additive manufacturing that people might uh, adapt with years uh, but I want to pinpoint you know one aspect that is a little different than people are thinking today and we see that a lot in the software and that's the difference between aspect ratio the ratio between the width and the length and the height of the feature within the part, between that to thin walls, you know, uh, what you really need to think of in 3D printing is this aspect ratio, you know, how far or how thin a feature within the part is from the main body if you don't want it to, to, to break. And that's a, a bit of a change. And, and I would say that there are a lot of tools to predict that and uh, we provide a few of them. Um, and the last point that I want to make, uh, and sorry for the long answer, is the financial aspect. I would say that there is always a break-even point versus traditional manufacturing methods, okay? Even if you're calculating versus CNC or versus vacuum forming, there is always an investment in the beginning that you need to decrease with time. And uh, uh, bringing this state of mind into consideration, meaning that there is a quantity of parts out there that additive might fit to. Uh, so there is always a break even point, you just need to find it. And it's hard. And uh, again, now uh, we supply a few of the solutions out there to calculate that. Um, these are the three elements that I wanted to mention today. I was to circle back to the geometry one. Uh, because we launched with a metal printer, that means the significant portion of the parts that come across our desk are metal castings. And this is where I come to the, what I call the, the game of millimeters. Uh, almost every single cast is in center away. Absolutely is an excellent candidate for 3D printing with a small number of changes that are on the scale of millimeters. It's not completely redesigning it. Often people look at the, the very fancy organic shapes or the you know, procedurally generated ones that ship at trade shows and think that's what they need to design for to be successful with 3D printing. In reality, sometimes it's simple as changing a radius to a chamfer or filling in a small hole that you're going to drill out later anyway. Uh, and making it clear to your engineers that it's acceptable to have this kind of flexibility, making small changes that don't exactly match the design limitations from traditional manufacturing because it because you know, metal casting absolutely has design limitations uh, it highly struggles with the aspect ratio that Omar was talking about. Uh, but encouraging engineers to be more open-minded, more flexible, uh, really helps to unlock some of the potential. Thank you for that. Um, we're getting a uh, coming in thick and fast now. So um, let's go to the most popular ones, which is uh, what industries are leading the use of additive for resolving supply chain issues? Um, Omar, perhaps you'd like to tackle that one first, and then William, you can uh, you can chip in afterwards. Um, we, we see a, a big trend in the machinery industry. 
uh, which means that uh, mechanical parts, which are not the, let's say they're not the heart of the machine, okay? They're not the core of what this machine is doing. It's not the engine of a car, but it's a peripheral part, not the sexiest one, you know? And it's those parts that people are ready to uh, use additive uh, instead of traditional manufacturing way and use the benefits of, of supply chain. This is what we see. Perspective yeah. on the uh, leading industry. Yeah, two two areas where we've seen some rapid movement. The first one that should be in medical devices. Uh, you know, some you know, well known uh, story of all the companies that pivoted to help produce medical equipment, even simple medical equipment, uh, in response to COVID. Uh, that wasn't a choice in their part. That was just something that they had to do. And uh, I think that if you go ask them, they'll tell you that it was far less painful than they would have expected. It was probably a much more rewarding experience uh, than they would have thought changing their whole supply chain over. Uh, and the other one would be uh, MRNU for sometimes the militaries. Uh, these are often the highly complex machines that need long-term maintenance. and even if they're not actually making the induced parts for it, uh, they, they often have tools, uh, tooling that is uh, unique or specialized, and they only have one, and they need it at you know five different military bases. So being able to 3D print that specialized tooling actually indirectly solves them a supply chain problem of being able to maintain their vehicles. Um, let's have one more question from the audience before we go into the back to the more structured program. Um, and uh, Tim Simpson asks, um, well, first he says, William, great point on metal castings. What is your opinion on adoption rates or limitations of additive technologies for binder jetting to make 3D sand molds? Uh, yeah, I'm, 3D printed molds are a great way to achieve almost the same result. Uh, it is almost tools manufacturing and it is almost as fast. That's, those are the two caveats though. It's, it's almost as good. And this is generally where I encourage people to say, all right, uh, there's no sense in being timid. If you're looking for a solution, consider you know, making the end use part directly. Uh, but there are some times where if you're doing, uh, I'm thinking in my mind, I'm assuming your question is based around binder jetting for sand casting molds where you're you're actually gluing the sand together. Uh, yeah, that can definitely be a good choice, but only for certain parts. It doesn't scale down very well. Thank you for that. Right, okay, so we'll come back to questions from the audience um, in a bit, but um, I've got a question for you both. So how do you see the future of supply chains using 3D printing technology? William, perhaps you'd like to tackle that one first. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I think some of my answers have been a bit long, so I'll keep this one short, and that, in most industries, through uh, 3D printing and traditional manufacturing are going to be used side by side. Uh, 3D printing right now is well less than 1% of global manufacturing. If it increased 10 times, it'd still be the minority player. And that means that having the mindset to solve problems using both is going to be the key rather than hard optimizing into either one of them. Size answer, Omar. The uh, <laughs> like yours. Uh, I uh, engineer. I thought of of thinking of things that has to do with with you know the geometry of the parts or with the the parts themselves. And and what we see is two big trends. The first is weight reduction, which means that uh, additive. It's one of the biggest tickets of additive today. So we see a lot of companies in generative design and topology optimization helping companies to reduce weight from parts. And reducing weight is also reducing weight uh, from an airplane or from a car or from a medical device, and that that's obviously uh, where the world is is heading to. We have we have our own solution in in that regards. And the second is about uh, parts consolidation. That's the ability to reduce parts counts. Okay, that's has a lot with supply chain, reducing the packaging, reducing the the labor costs involved in uh, in assembled complex parts. So uh, these are two tickets of additive that the other technology is currently uh, lacking to achieve, and, and we see a big trend uh, moving there. And again, we will 
when we will reach to the point when we show some aspects of the software, then we can show how it works in Castro. That point now, actually, let's um, let's uh, have a look at, at your software. If you want to sort of um, share um, share a quick demo, we can go through that now. Yeah, I, I will share my screen. I think that the best way would be in the tables afterwards, right? I mean, this is uh, how it usually works uh, from what I saw in the webinars on 3DPI. So, so I'll leave time for that. But I'll, if I can quickly share my screen mm -hmm. just to show how we're tackling aspects that has to do with supply chain benefits. Uh, so if you all can see my screen, this is... Uh, results page what we see now that coming out from caster software uh it's an assembly of uh something that it's hard to define it has 10 parts in it um most of the parts are not cost effective it means screws bolts nuts we take them out from the analysis some parts are not printable some parts are printable with changes and some parts are suitable as is for additive manufacturing and few of them out of the suitable are all also cost effective versus traditional manufacturing way. And when I'm saying that, I'm, I really mean that uh, we take into account those aspects of supply chain, meaning that if we've uh, mentioned that a part has a chance to be cheaper than the traditional manufacturing way, uh, then we actually take into account those aspects. It means that we calculate the break-even point versus traditional manufacturing way. And when you deep dive into it, you can see some of those variables that we've mentioned today. The upfront payment of casting versus 3D printing is here. You know, the tooling, the tooling we've mentioned earlier, that's uh, being divided by the number of parts the company wants to, to produce. The... Uh, the production cost itself. We're very good in, in giving you the, let's say the basics uh, of, of the variables needs to be considered when you're thinking about additive manufacturing, the material cost, the uh, machine cost, consumables, post-process when needed, etc., And eventually the inventory costs, which as we've mentioned, has to do with, the, with holding the parts on a shelf the ordering of the part has some costs. You need to pay the the NPI manager. You need to pay to the uh, purchasing guy. You need to pay to the uh, to the um, warehouses uh, and everything. That's all included. Uh, we've talked about scrap. Uh, William mentioned that. That's the I would say uh, in seventy percent of the cases you need to throw away the parts you manufacture in traditional manufacturing way when you are thinking on spare parts and then you need to maintain your tool whereas in 3d printing you don't have a tool and then you can neglect this uh this cost okay so all of that is is part of the calculations in in caster and uh again i uh invite you to the tables afterwards to, to see it uh, uh, in a live demo, okay? Excellent. We'll get to uh, to get to those live demos and those um, breakout sessions uh, very soon. Um, we've got a couple more questions um, that have come in, so um, um, please feel free to answer these um, as you as you feel. So the first one is: How do you see the adoption of DFAM progressing? If you'd like to tackle that. Um, us as a startup company, uh, we're not trying to educate engineers to think 3D printing when they start to design. It might be Xerox job, but uh, we're trying to uh, assess an existing design of engineers to say, to say if it makes sense to use additive or whether it needs changes uh, that can utilize the benefits of additive. So what we found is... Uh, is an interesting thing, okay? It's not directly connected to the question, but what we've found is that if you're managing to convince the production engineer, those who are who didn't design the part, but they care about the cost reduction or the, the uh, added value of additive in making the part, he is the guy, the production engineer, that can convince the mechanical engineer to change the design towards additive manufacturing because he already speaks the language of of costs, time, flexibility in manufacturing, et cetera. And that affects the adoption of 
the FAM because eventually we need to convince, let's say, more engineers to think 3D printing when they start to design. So this is my takeaway. What are your thoughts about design for additive manufacturing? Yeah, uh, I mentioned earlier some of the you know, very fancy organic or you know, procedurally generated parts that you'll see at trade shows, and that's what people's mind goes to when you hear DFAM. Uh, I, I see a general need for a, a simpler set of tools. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to optimize uh, down to the last percentile. I'm just trying to make a part printable. I, I know what I want it to do, and I want to get some you know, simple feedback from the software uh, about what tweaks are needed. That would be the, uh, the, the main feedback I would give. Excellent. And uh, we've got one for you as well here, Emma, which is uh, from Tim Simpson, who asks, uh, to what extent are material substitutions or process parts certification considered in the cost model? Uh, the example you showed just now in the demo, um, it used uh, aluminium um, 4008 versus aluminium 6061. Is NRE considered for analysis, for example? Uh, that, that's a very good uh, question. Thanks for that, Tim. I would say that Castor is solving one problem out of the a lot of problems needs to be solved in order to um, make additive a sustainable manufacturing method. Uh, certification is one of them. We created a screening tool where the idea is to show the potential, to show that this part can do what the part should do in the real life, and that the material in, in general addresses the traditional manufacturing uh, mechanical properties and the geometry stands in the limitation of the printer and the cost effectiveness has a chance to be cheaper. We even have a way to do finite elements analysis when you put the forces and you screening wise see if the parts has a chance to to uh, to do what he needs to do in the real life. So and, and certification is one step after that. Okay, now you have a part, you like it, you like the results, and you need to go to check if it has a certification, yes or no. So shortly uh currently the answer is no but uh it's uh it requires uh, a lot of things in it so we uh we point the user to the next level after caster to to do those kind of uh checks okay so um those are the questions we've had um we're now going to move to the next uh stage which is the networking session um just a reminder, the best experience will be if you do um, activate your webcam and microphone. Um, to navigate between tables, simply double click um, and you'll be moved to a seat on the tables. Um, the experts from Castor and Xerox will be available to answer your questions and you can obviously exchange contact details if you want to carry on the conversation after this event concludes. Um, so on that note, I'd like to thank you both, Omar and William, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you, everybody, for um, tuning into this section. Don't go away. We are going to be in a networking session right away. So thank you all. See you there.